have no regard or respect for rich, and I think they all should be exterminated. What is American gangster about? They're them American rich. Rayful and Hal Poe and Nicky Balls and Terry Bull. Man, them rich. about to see the first part of our series may be disturbing. If the kids are still awake, discretion is advised. Rafael Edmund, who was once called the biggest drug dealer in Washington, D.C. I don't think anybody has ever monopolized the drug trade to that extent before or after Rafael. You turn the tremendous intellect and leadership skills into building a criminal organization, the likes of which the Washington, D.C. had never seen. I remember when he first met Melvin Butler, you know what I mean? You could tell they was on some gang shit. Prosecutors say Butler was Edmonds' West Coast cocaine connection. Me and him took a trip to L.A. And when we when we got to L.A., Melvin gave us like 50000 uh, So Ray, he basically gave me about 20000 So we was out there for about a week. But when Melvin will come to D.C. We got the California dudes down here. Me, Melvin, Whitey. I mean, our whole little crew, we go be like three cars deep. So listening to Bootsy, the defendant's own mother, who was also convicted co-conspirator, talk to Alter Ray Zanfield about Rafael Edmond and how he got started in the drug business and how he got so huge in the drug business has got to be devastating. Edmund's unsuspecting mother talked at a local restaurant with a friend, a friend who had agreed to wear a wire for the prosecution. You know, like he was doing hand-to-hand -hand coming, him and Johnny, on the corner, and they were selling, so they were getting it all right. And then, he just, it just got to be, he just went out on his own. According to police, Edmund was so powerful and so dangerous, the jury in his trial had to sit behind bulletproof glass, their identities hidden from the public for their own safety. They had an anonymous jury panel so that the jurors' names and addresses weren't uh, put on the jury list as they do in any other trial. They weren't scared of the judge, you know, because he was real polite. You know, showed him a lot of respect and let him know that he appreciated him sitting there as jurors, you know, through this long trial. And they weren't scared of the prosecutors because they weren't on trial, they were just doing their job, they was at work every day. So the only person in the courtroom to be scared of, they wouldn't scare the defense attorneys because they was doing their job every day. Only people in the courtroom to be scared of or think all this is for can be the defendants. The jury found Edmund guilty of a massive drug conspiracy and sentenced him to life without parole. I always knew throughout the whole trial that we was going to get found guilty. I got a tip from an informant that Rafel was setting up deals from the prison at Lewisburg. Edmund's drug activities while incarcerated surpassed in volume <coughs> and in scope the drug distribution network that he developed and ran prior to his imprisonment. Communication between the capitals of Colombia, one of the drug producing centers of the world, and the United States, one of the drug consuming centers of the world, exists on two levels. Cellmate at USP Lewisburg was the third largest cocaine dealer in the world. Chicky Osvaldo Trujillo Blanco. One of the sons of uh, Griselda Blanco, who was one of the original founders of the Medellin Cartel. He's sitting on top of a family empire in Colombia manufacturing cocaine. Rafael knew when he was back on the street, he made all these connections. Played the tapes for him of his voice setting up drug deals. You get any money already? Uh, you get any money? We had the undercover officer there that you could meet and see who we'd actually been had, uh, arranged for drugs with. Okay, with the evidence we had against him, how long we'd been uh, investigating him. I have no problem using snitches. You ha you have to to prove the cases under our, our system of, of laws. He told us that. He'd been thinking about this for a very long time. He'd already made a decision 
that when they stepped to him, he was going to cooperate. We arranged for him to call uh, us, collect at an undercover apartment, and then instead of his uh, friends and family three-way phone calls, we would three-way the phone call for him. You beep your source, he gets back to you on the number, you make your arrangements, and it's normally by public telephones, which make interception by electronic surveillance. And that's how we set it up, they will call me and I will call back. We were very surprised that Rafel was hoping for this. Well, right now it's kind of sad. Um, because when I'm in jail most of the time, I'm separated from everybody. You know, they keep me locked down. I don't like that, I'd rather be just a, you know, ordinary prisoner. I don't want to be looked at like I'm different than any other human being that's in jail. I'm just like them, I'm in jail right now. What about your mother? My mother? Your mother, on tape, talking about you. I don't know if she was talking about me or who she was talking about. In the war on drugs, one of the most important weapons the government uses is the informant. With mandatory minimum penalties now for drug offenses, the pressure is on to name names. But with so much at stake, can an informant be trusted to be telling the truth? By the early 90s, the government was paying informants or snitches more than $100 million a year. They paid thousands of others by reducing their sentences. You ever wake up in the middle of the night and say, I'm 25 years old, mm -hmm. and they tell me I'm going to have to spend the rest of my life here? Nah, I don't ever wake up and say that because... I don't believe it. I don't, I don't believe that I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail because I don't think that was meant for me to spend the rest of my life in jail. So I just don't look at it like that. I honestly don't believe it. I never even thought about it as far as just knowing I'm going to be there even 10 or 15 years. I just know some, something is going to happen good and I'm going to eventually get out. And I'm going to eventually get out. I'm going to eventually get out. He walked confidently toward the police helicopter, turned and mouthed these words. Look closely. Rafael Edmonds said, I'll be back. Rafael Edmund III, remember that name, was sentenced to life in prison, but a district court just filed a motion to reduce that sentence. Want to know why? John Henry will tell you. To understand why this is such big news, you first have to know the major impact Rafael Edmund had on D.C. 30 years ago. In the late 1980s and early 90s, it was a lawless combat zone. Back then, the district was murder capital of the country. An automatic gunfire rang out. And the crack cocaine epidemic helped fuel it. People lining up two to three deep around the block to buy drugs. At the center of it all, Rayful Edmond. Edmond ran the biggest crack and cocaine distribution ring in D.C. history. I seen somebody at that time that was bigger than life. At one point, he made up to $60,000 a day. That is, until he got caught. Edmund is serving a mandatory life term. And yet, behind bars, he still broke the law. There have been abuses of privileges that these inmates were given. The operation from prison rivaled the scope of the organization Edmund once ran from his northeast neighborhood. Now, Edmund got an additional 30 years for his crimes in prison. So why did the feds now think he should be released early? Well, apparently, he talked a lot. For 20 years, the D.C. United States attorney said his cooperation had been both deep and wide. He discussed cold case murders, participated in reverse undercover drug sting operations. It ultimately all led the attorney's office to ask a judge to consider reducing the 54-year-old's life sentence for his D.C. crimes to an unspecified term. Now it's up to a judge to see if that should happen. Well, today, the last of four community hearings took place to help a federal court judge decide whether or not convicted drug kingpin Rafael Edmond should be released from prison early. As Inez de la Quatera reports, those who attended today's hearing were divided over what should happen next. The name of notorious cocaine dealer Rafael Edmond is often enough to get a strong reaction from any Washingtonian. He was a part of an organized crime family. They murdered and slaughtered people. They decimated this city. The federal government has asked a judge to resentence Edmund after he cooperated with investigators, which has reportedly resulted in the arrests of dozens of other drug dealers. Today, D.C.'s Attorney General asked Washingtonians to answer two questions. 
Do you believe the court should grant the United States motion and reduce the sentence of Rafael Edmond? And if Mr. Edmond's sentence is reduced and he is ultimately released, would you support his returning to the district? Edmond should not only not receive an early release, he should not be allowed near any young people. Telling on somebody, telling somebody that somebody did something to save your own butt is not rehabilitation. Thank <laughs> you.